Okay, so we're going to begin. Tonight I'm not going to do the usual series, the 70 most difficult questions, but uh, we're going to cover a very important topic that is very relevant to the parashat that is going to be read this week, parashat Kedoshim. Very timely because of the days of the Omer. The name of the topic is Sinat Hinam, baseless hatred. Something that many of you perhaps have heard of, something that has existed in the past and unfortunately still around us. So it's very important to talk about this symptom called Sinat Hinam. During the days of the Omer, when we're counting the Omer every day, every night, from Pesach until Chag HaShavuot, we're basically counting in anticipation towards receiving the Torah in Chag HaShavuot. We're excited. Counting means that we're excited, we're looking forward to something. But during this time of actually looking forward, of being happy as we count, there are some days of partial mourning. We mourn for a very tragic event that occurred after the destruction of the Second Temple, where, where during a very short period of time, 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva passed away in a plague. When so many students die in a short time, young, it is obviously something in Hashemayim. It could not have happened by accident. It was a punishment, the rabbis tell us, they were not respectful of each other. These are giants in Torah. We're definitely not in the position to judge them. But nevertheless, we know that en yisurim beli avon, there's no such thing as one suffering or leaving this world without any cause, just like that. There was some sin. There was some accusation against them. And it has to do with a lack of kavod, lack of respect for each other. The mourning that we practice during these days, it's a partial mourning, there are no wedding ceremonies, no music is heard. We don't shave or take haircuts. What is this mourning meant for? What do we accomplish by mourning? Well, first of all, when we mourn, we're supposed to remember or imagine what we've lost, what difference they would have made had they still been around, 24,000 giants in Torah, what the world of Torah would have been like. Imagine if all the six million would not have died in the Holocaust. What would the Jewish people be like today? I think it would have been a very, very different Jewish world today had we still had them around. The influence of 24,000 Tamidei Chachamim is gone. It's a big loss to Am Yisrael. So one of the reasons for mourning is to realize the tremendous loss to the Torah world. But mourning for them is also meant for us to remember that it is up to us to repair, to be metakin, something that still exists amongst us, that is still a problem, the sinat chinam. So when we mourn, we're supposed to think about that problem and attempt to do whatever we can to repair it. Mourning does something else. When one mourns, when actually one goes to a house of mourning, he is sharing in the pain of those who have just suffered a loss. So when we mourn for this terrible tragedy, we're basically showing that it pains us, that we've lost something very dear to us. And that sharing in the pain, as we will soon see, is a very important ma'aseh, it's a very important deed to show that we care, to show that their loss is our loss. To feel the pain for every Jew is a very important feeling that was unfortunately lacking in that generation. And of course, at that time, this was very sensitive because the Hurban Abayit, the destruction of the Second Temple, came about as a result of baseless hatred, sin at hinam. What is baseless hatred? In other words, there's no foundation, no real purpose, no logic for the hatred. 
and I'm going to explain a little bit as we go along how does this develop? How did such great rabbis come to this? And what we can do to eliminate this? I think that Rabbi Akiva on this week's parasha, on the pasuk ve'aftale rechakamocha, when he said that you should love thy friend as you love thyself, which means you should care about somebody else, be as concerned for the welfare of another Jew as you are about yourself. When he said that, possibly it was after this terrible tragedy. It could be that it's not that he didn't know this before, that he felt that it was of utmost importance to remind those who are learning Torah. Zek lal gadol batorah. This pasuk ve'aftal erecha kamocha is the foundation of the entire Torah. It is useless to learn Torah without paying attention to this pasuk. Zekral gadol batorah means that if you fulfill this mitzvah properly, in other words, if you comply with ahavat haverim, in other words, you care about them, you're concerned about them, you take care of them, then you will have an easier time fulfilling a great deal of the mitzvot in the Torah, which happen to be ben adam lechavero, between one and and another. There are two parts of the Torah, right? There are mitzvot concerning the relationship between us and our fellow Jews, and there are mitzvot like tefillin and Shabbat that concern our relationship with Hashem. Be'aftal Mocha is a very important mitzvah. It's the foundation that many mitzvot depend on. You, if we are able to fulfill this one mitzvah, then we will have an easier time with pretty much the entire Torah. Why is this mitzvah so important? Rabbis tell us, Torah. We all know how precious the Torah is, but there's something called Derecheretz. Derecheretz means good character. That comes before the Torah. It's not only good character, it also means those mitzvot ben adam lechavero, the mitzvot between us and our fellow Jews, that comes first. If that is lacking, then the rest of the Torah is worthless. And that is what the rabbis mean, that if one learns the Torah lishma for its real sake, for its real purpose, that Torah will be for him a sam hayim, it will be a portion of life. It will show him how to live his life properly. If Chaz Shalom, he does not have the Derech Eretz, he does not learn the Torah Lishma, that same Torah that he will study will be to him a Sam Hamavet, it will be a portion of death. It may bring about his death. He will misuse it. He will abuse others with that knowledge of the Torah. He will misunderstand, he will misinterpret, it will be something that he will misuse in life and therefore it will be something that will go against him. Instead of helping him, instead of guiding him, it will bring about his downfall. The Torah has tremendous powers. It depends how you learn it, what your intention is when you're learning it. The Torah is not only something that we're supposed to live by in order that we be rewarded later on for following instructions. The Torah is supposed to make something of ourselves, better people, to refine our character. When Hashem says, Na'ase Adam, let us create man, He's speaking to us. Let me and you create man. Let's make something of this man who as he's born is yet incomplete. He needs to grow, to mature. He has a raw character that needs to be refined. And that refinement can come about through the Torah, through the many, many mitzvot in the Torah that are supposed to accomplish that which we call Derech Eretz. So Derech Eretz, Kadma Le Torah, it comes before the Torah because that, those midot, that, those characteristics that the Torah wants to imbue in us is the foundation of everything. Therefore, it makes 
complete sense, and it should not come as a surprise to you, that it's possible to find a Talmid Chacham Gadol, a tremendous learned scholar, a genius, who behaves like a wild animal. Not only who behaves like a wild animal, but who's also a rasha, a wicked man, who transgresses the mitzvot. What does one thing have to do with another? The fact that he is learned, that he knows, he doesn't practice what he preaches, he doesn't fulfill what he knows, what he learned. It's not a contradiction. There have been many such individuals who were very learned in the Torah. Even in the Vatican, there were many Catholics who were very well versed in our Talmud. So what? It depends what your plan is, why you're learning this. To show off? What are you trying to achieve by knowing all this Torah? When it is done properly, with the right intentions, the Torah will be a tremendous help in uplifting one, in refining him. Otherwise, it could have the opposite effect. And that is what Shalomo Melech meant when he said, Nezem zahav be'af hazir, isha yafa v'sarat ta'am. It's like a gold ring in the snout, in the nose of a pig. What a beautiful piece of jewelry, made out of pure gold. Where is it sitting on? The snout of a pig. What a shame. The same thing is Ishayafa, a beautiful woman, but the Saratam. There's something not right ab about her nature, about her character. What good is all that beauty when the inside is rotten? What good is all that Torah if this individual is corrupt? And that is what the rabbis meant when they said, Im en derecheretz, en Torah. If there's no derecheretz, good manners, good character in that individual, there's no Torah. What does it mean? But he has Torah. No, the Torah that he possesses is useless. It's not worth anything. Because the derecheretz is intended to bring about a change in a person. Therefore, if it's lacking, if it's not there, what good is it if he follows up and learns the Torah? It becomes just something of an academic nature, an academic exercise that is useless if it does not bring about a change in this individual. Before we continue on in trying to understand why great people lack their echeretz, why even though they have so learned it in Torah, they stumble, and they lack the kavod and the respect and consideration for others. Before we go on to that part, I want to share with you briefly another part of what the rabbis tell us that is very puzzling. Just like they tell us that if there's no Torah, if there's no derech heretz, the Torah that is there is useless, they also tell us the opposite. If there is no Torah, then there's no derech heretz. If one does not possess the knowledge of the Torah, it is not possible for him to have derech heretz, good character. That's very difficult to understand. I'm sure you know, as well as I know, many nice people who are totally ignorant of the Torah and have an excellent character. Very refined people, Jews and non-Jews alike. There's no Torah and still there is derech heretz. So how could the rabbis tell us, if there is no Torah, then there also cannot be derech heretz. The way I like to explain this is with the Mishnah. In Masechet Baba Kama, the Mishnah discusses damages that occurred as a result of one's animal, one's ox goring. An ox can gore, but it is not always in the habit of goring. And that is why there's called, there's something called a short tam and a short mu'ad. A short tam is an ox that has only gored once, twice. And therefore he does not have that tendency. He's not prone necessarily to do it again. If he got away and did it, you pay a knas a penalty of 50% damages. You're not fully responsible because how should you know? It was unexpected. Not anticipated. 
and you did your best to watch over him. Once it's a shor mu'ad, once it's an axe that has a tendency, that has proven that he has done it three times, then you better put it behind bars. Then you better protect it well, because if it gets out, you are fully responsible 100%. Shor mu'ad, he's prone to, to damage. He's prone to gore. Watch over him. Don't take any chances. The Mishnah continues on to tell us. However, if you have the following pets, you're always going to be responsible 100%. Which pets? A lion, a wolf, a bear, a leopard, a hyena, some say it's another animal, the bardelas, and a snake. These are always mu'adim. These are always prone to hurt people. And just recently we heard about an, a bear, a young bear, who killed his own trainer. Familiar story, we've heard it many times in circuses, all over the place. Wild animals turning on their own trainers after many years of a good relationship. Who would expect it? Why did this happen? Because a wild animal you can train, but you cannot tame. It's a wild animal. It's unpredictable. And when something is unpredictable, you cannot guarantee. If you have him as a pet, you're completely and always responsible for it. Yes, it's possible for some individuals to have their echerets without Torah. But is there anything to guarantee that tomorrow he will not stick a knife in your back? A lot of Polish non-Jews were very friendly towards the Jews. What happened when the Nazis rose to power? They turned their backs on the Jews. They even turned them in, some of them. What about those Arabs that worked for 15 years in the construction business? Supposedly very devoted laborers to their boss. And one day that same devoted laborer for 15 years kills his own boss. Haven't you heard about these kind of things? Why does it happen? Because there's no guarantee. If one has nothing to anchor him, to hold him back, he may do it. What holds back people here from doing things? Because they may go to jail. Right? Then nobody wants to go to jail. That is some deterrent. If there's no deterrent, what is to guarantee that he may not do it? If one has no Torah, even though he is endowed with, by nature, by birth, through education, with good character, there's no guarantee that that will last. That is why the rabbis tell us in, in Torah, if there's no Torah to guarantee it, to anchor it down, the derecheretz that exists there is not something that you can rely on. It's there. People may have a nice personality, but it's, you cannot guarantee that they will not behave like animals one day. Getting back to what we were saying before, if one does not learn the Torah for its real sake, then the Torah, instead of elevating him, instead of refining him, will create competition. It will give him a certain attitude of haughtiness, of, of arrogance. Here he knows so much, he knows more than others. It will have the opposite effect, it will turn to be a samhamavet. It will be negative influence over him. Whereas Pretty much all the mitzvot in the Torah that concern ben adam lechavero, our relationship with our fellow Jew, are intended to bring about harmony, consideration, and concern for one another. This is exact opposite. One who learns for the wrong reasons will become detached, uninterested, and selfish. Mitzvot are intended to bring about equality and concern, true concern. And here you have an individual who's very far from this. And now I'm going to reveal to you something incredible. You want to know where a person is holding 
in his relationship with other Jews? You want an easy way to know if a person thinks of himself or if he's considerate of others? There's one way that you can tell. If an individual speaks Lashonara, Lashonara means to talk negatively of others, to put other people down, to gossip in a negative, demeaning way about other people. When one does that, especially regularly, that shows that he has some arrogance. Why? Because only if one has arrogance does he look down at others. Because what's arrogance? You consider yourself better. Some people bring other people down because it makes them feel better. It's not that they really feel greater or smarter, but it makes them feel better by putting others down. Regardless, it's the same thing. It comes from, it originates, it stems from gava, arrogance. A person thinks more highly of himself. He's lacking, of, therefore, the consideration for another Jew. He's therefore capable of speaking, Lashonara, of putting down others. The distance between Lashonara and lack of consideration and baseless hatred is very small, very short distance. One thing leads to another. It's all in the same family. To talk negatively about others, not to be considerate, not to think highly of somebody, that is all baseless hatred, that is all sinat chinam. What should happen if one learns Torah for its real sake? Automatically one will gain aracha, a certain admiration for every human being, Jew or non-Jew. Why? He's created in the image of God. God treats him in a very important and dignified way. He's precious in the eyes of God. He created him. Then why don't you want to do that too? Why is he any less to you? So the first step of perhaps eradicating this Lashonara, this symptom from us, is to realize that we must look up at every human being only because, only because he was created by Tzalem Elohim. What about those evil people? Are we supposed to look up to them too? Evil people, there are many, unfortunately. What we're supposed to not like about them and hate is not them, but their behavior. When we hate somebody and we're, that we are allowed to hate, we're not, we don't hate him, we hate his behavior. That is the difference between good hate and bad hate. We don't hate the individual. He's created by Tzalem Elohim. We feel bad for him that he's like that. We hate his behavior. Another reason why we hate someone that can be hated is because the Torah tells us as follows, This week's parasha, do not hate your brother in your heart. Do not hold a grudge against him. If you have something against somebody, tell him what you feel about him. Don't keep it inside. But the Torah makes a point to say, don't hate your brother. So the rabbis tell us, what do you mean your brother? Yeah, if he behaves as a brother. But if he does not behave as a brother, you're allowed to hate him. What does that mean? Anybody here understand or know or have heard once of the people called the Erev Rav? The Erev Rav are the multitudes amongst us who joined us when we left Egypt. They wanted to be part of the Jewish nation. They're the source of most of our troubles. As the Prophet says, Your biggest troublemakers will come from amongst you. They've caused us numerous problems. They fight against everything that is holy. They derive their power from the sitra hara, from the impure forces. They don't have good midot. They don't use their sechel, their mind, in what they do. They're basically being driven by bad character and by the energy or by the power of the sitra hara. 
But they are our brothers. What are we supposed to do with them? What should our attitude be towards them? Torah says, When he behaves as a brother, but they don't behave as our brother. On the contrary, they've acted worse than many of our enemies. Nevertheless, they're still our brothers. So what are we supposed to do? How should we relate to them? So basically, in the Amidah, you will find an interesting blessing. We used to have 18 blessings until the 19th blessing was added. What is the 19th blessing that was proposed? May all the heretics and slanderers or informers not have any hope. We pray that they should not succeed. We're not praying for their demise, that they should be killed. The rabbis tell us, be careful when we're talking about another Jew, our approach should be, Yitamu hataim velo hoteim. Let all sin cease to exist, but not sinners. We're not pointing to, let all sinners cease to exist. Yitamu hataim. Let all sin cease to exist. So again, our emphasis is on their behavior. Our emphasis is on the sin, not on the sinner himself. Why was this blessing composed then? For us to pray, not only that they should do Teshuvah, of course, we're always supposed to be hopeful and not give up hope on any Jew, but the real idea behind this blessing is that we should stay away from them. There is always the danger that we will tolerate them, and if you tolerate them, you will learn from them, you will sympathize with them. And that is prohibited. That is a no-no. That is dangerous. So we recognize their danger and we keep a distance. That is correct. That is healthy. That is the right thing to do. So the prayer is there to remind us, these are your enemies. Not your friends. Yeah, but they're my brothers. No, they're not behaving like your brother. They're against you. They will fight everything that you believe in. They will weaken your, your connection to Hashem. They are your enemies. So in order for us to remember that these brothers are our enemy, there is a prayer inserted in the Amidah. So we have to recognize that fact that there are some individuals out there who may be Jews who are not our brothers, who do not behave like our brothers, and we have to realize that they are an enemy. But we're not praying for their demise. We're praying that they should do Teshuvah. We're praying that they should change their ways. That, yes... We hate their behavior. We will not tolerate what they believe in. That we have to know. That we have to teach to our kids because we have to recognize right from wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. On the contrary, that has to be emphasized. Their danger is a greater danger to the Jewish people than any other enemy. I always like to say that in every Jew, no matter how bad he behaves himself no matter what he does. One should always try to look for something good in him. What good can we find in the Erev Rav? I believe, this is my opinion, but I've heard other Kabbalists say it too, that it's very possible since they are responsible to an extent for the destruction of the Second Temple, which they contributed to, they invited the Romans pretty much in, they accelerated the destruction, Hashem says, I'm going to bring you back in a reincarnation right before Mashiach comes. You remember back then, 1932 years ago, you lent a hand to destroy the Holy Temple. You lent a hand to exile the people from their land. I'm going to bring you back and you're going to dry up the swamps in Eretz Israel. You're going to build the infrastructure and you're going to accommodate the mass immigration that will come about in 1948 and after. Hashem is allowing these people who destroyed to come back and build. Unfortunately, today they're busying themselves in destroying again by dismantling outposts, by giving away Gush Katif. Nevertheless, we still have Baruch Hashem, a good deal of Eretz Yisrael intact. Perhaps that is their role their share 
in having to rebuild what they destroyed. That I like to see something good in everybody, even in them. Judaism has therefore always believed in achdut, in promoting unity and not pilugim, not divisiveness, even though unfortunately the galut, the diaspora, has brought about many differences in the customs between Ashkenazim and Sephardim and Yemenite Jews. It's only the galut. We're all really brothers and sisters. We're all of the same family. And we should recognize that these differences are so minor that they should not exist in a, in a way. But they do. Let us not allow them to divide us. Let us not overlook the fact that there's so much more that unites us. We all say the same Shema Yisrael. We all believe in the same Torah. Rabbis tell us that if Am Yisrael really holds on to Achdut, even if they would be worshipping idols, Hashem would not punish them. Why not? If they're united, That's the Midrash says, Hashem will not touch them. Why is unity so powerful? Perhaps there's a clue in what Shalom Melech tells us in Mishle. Sin'ah means hatred. Hatred between people begets medanim, fights, arguments. Hatred, people don't like each other, people have differences of opinion. All of that leads, it begets to fights. If there's true love between friends, between people, this love overlooks, gives you the ability to overlook other people's faults. If you really love somebody, you care for somebody, and they have a fault, you will overlook it. A sound, healthy relationship between husband and wife, and nobody's perfect, we're not angels, we all have our weaknesses and faults, should be this way. Yes, I recognize that he or she is like this, but I'm willing to overlook it, because I love them so much, I care for them so much. As long as, of course, there's something good left over. I mean, if something would, somebody's completely bad and evil, there's very little to look. I mean, <laughs> how can you overlook everything? But that, that is the correct way of looking at people, always looking for the good and trying to overlook the faults. And after all, if you married them, you were put there for good reason, to help them with those faults, not to run away from them. Maybe you're the one that's best fit to, to help them. So that is the difference between hatred and love. True love looks away, and hatred just looks to find reason to hate. I very much like to add something that people do, to, totally do not understand today when it comes to the Israeli and Arab conflict. Let's throw them out. That will solve all our problems. Those Arabs, the enemy, their sworn enemy. If we just throw them out, everything will be okay. Of course, nobody wants to live with an enemy. I don't think there's any argument amongst many Jews, not all, that they, are, they may be a sworn enemy. Fine. But do you really think, honestly think, that if you throw them out, all the problems will be solved? How are you going to throw out the Egyptians from Egypt, the Syrians from Syria, the Lebanese from Lebanon? What about the Jordanians? What about the Iraqis? And are you going to throw the Iranians out of Iran, push them to North Korea? I mean, you're going to push all the enemies away? I mean... Think about it. Okay, you got rid of this enemy that is 25 miles away from you. Okay, what about those that are 100 or 200 miles away from you? They're there too. You're gonna, how are you going to get rid of them? And there are people out there, intelligent people, who well, that's all they do. They speak about what we got to do to solve this Arab problem. Got to get rid of them. We can't allow for this democracy to continue the way it is. We can't allow them to have equal rights. They're going to be more than us. They're avoiding the main issue. How do you fight darkness? You don't fight darkness with more darkness. They're fighting you with arms. You don't fight them with arms. How do you win the war? The way you drive away darkness is with light. That is how you drive away darkness. 
when we have a problem with an enemy, it's obviously mina shamayim. And I've said this many, many times. It's all mina shamayim. There's something that we're doing that is not right. What are they demonstrating? Anti-Semitism. What's anti-Semitism? Sinat chinam. Baseless hatred. No reason. They once claimed we were communists. They later changed their minds. We're the capitalists. Then they came up with another excuse. The Jews are all the rich ones. They control Hollywood. They control the press. They control the media. They're always going to come up with something else. And the Catholics, of course, have their own version that we kill Christian children to make matzah with their blood. You know? Then you have the protocols of Zion. We're out there to control the world, to take over. No matter where you go, no matter who you hear it from, they don't like us because we don't like each other. That sinat chinam is because of our sinat chinam, because of our distance from our own tradition. We're not comfortable with our tradition. We have a problem with our tradition. They have to remind us that there's something wrong with us. How do you fight this problem, this enemy? By getting rid of the enemy from within, within every individual. Who is that enemy within every individual? It's the Yetzer Ara that we all have. He is the one that's responsible, that evil incarnation. He is the one that's responsible for all the division, for all the machloket, all the arguments, all the conflicts between husband and wives. Who is involved there? Also the Yetzera, the evil inclination. The greatest enemy of the Jew, of any human being, actually, is the Yetzera, not the Arab. Right? Not the Christian. Not the Goy. It's the enemy that is always there attempting to his best to ambush us. That's his job, to weaken us. And we, don't, we seem to forget that. We're trying to fight all these wars to get rid of the enemy out there, but they're not the true enemy. The true enemy is amongst us. The Yetzirah. I need to add that this... Avodah, that we call Avodah la Midot, working on one's character, is not easy. I admit it's a very difficult job. One works an entire lifetime to try to correct even one Midah, and he may not succeed, but at least he attempts to do his best. I think it was Rabbi Israel Salante, Zechet Tzadik Levracha, that said, to change one Midah is more difficult than to learn the entire Talmud. And that's not easy. So changing is something very difficult. One does not change completely, of course. You are what you are, but you can control yourself. That is what free will is all about. We're endowed with intelligence, with free will, and if we're guided properly by the Torah, we will hopefully make the right decisions. But if we're not guided by the Torah, we may just be remain selfish, interested in ourselves, in our own success, not in the well-being of our fellow Jews. So yes, it's difficult, but it does not mean that we are exempt. One has to work on his midot, on his character. The rabbis therefore admire one who has conquered himself, meaning one who has complete control and good discipline. And this is what they tell us, Ezu gibor hakovesh et yitzro. Who is really a powerful man? Not one who goes to the Olympics and picks up 300 kilo. Weightlifting. Oh, is he strong? A truly strong man is one who can control his character, one who has good discipline. He can control his anger if he's temperamental. He deserves our admiration. That's something that he achieved on his own. That's not a gift, Mishamayim. Then they tell us there's one who's even stronger than him. A lot of people are not aware of this one. A lot of people have heard, Ezeu Gibor, who is strong, a Kovesh one who controls himself. That he heard of. And here's one who's the strongest of all. Ezu gibor shebe giborim haose mison o havero. Whoever makes from his enemy a friend. Try that one. That one is really, really difficult. Some people don't, simply don't have the interest to do that. But according to the Kabbalah, you know who it means, haose mison o havero? That enemy means the Yetzer If you make from the Yetzer your friend, you can retire. <laughs> what does that mean? That the Yetzirah no longer bothers you, no longer goes after you, no longer pursues you with those same weaknesses 
There were tremendous challenges when you were young. You've worked so much on yourself, he lets go. He's become your friend. To make of your enemy your friend is very difficult indeed, but it is possible. And the Basuk says very clearly that that when Hashem approves of man's ways, of man's deeds, He will make sure that the enemy will make peace with Him. Sometimes, you know who that enemy is that doesn't make peace with you? Your wife. Sometimes Hashem uses the wife to oppose her husband. She all of a sudden becomes his enemy. What do I do, honey? What's wrong? He doesn't know what's going on. Hashem is using her to oppose him because obviously he did something wrong. So there are many shalichim, many messengers that Hashem could use to be an enemy, to oppose us. If he approves of our ways, if he's happy with us, all the enemies will make peace with us. During this time of the year, as I said earlier, that we count the Omer, we're actually preparing ourselves for Chag Shavuot, which is a Chag of Kabbalat Torah. This is the holiday that we receive the Torah. And in order to properly receive the Torah, we need to prepare ourselves. So one explanation given as to why we learn Pirkei Avot during the summer months after Pesach is before receiving the Torah, we learn about the Midot. Pirkei Avot contains many good advice and Midot Tovot. There was good character, good examples that we should follow. We try to learn that in order to purify our souls, in order to cleanse ourselves from all that Tum'ah that the Jews came out with from Mitzrayim. They needed this time. They needed a little bit of time until they were able to cleanse themselves to be able to receive the Torah. We don't just jump into Haga Shavuot. We prepare ourselves properly by emphasizing what comes first. What did we say comes first before? The Recheretz. We're not minimizing the value of the Torah, of learning of the Torah, but we're saying this without that cannot go. This is the foundation. If you have this foundation, you can build on it. And the Torah that you will learn will hopefully help you. The Midot, of course, will help us in many, many ways. But what we're trying to do during this time of the year and during, of course, the three weeks between Sheva Asar Tammuz and Tisha Be'av is to really eradicate the Sinat Hinam that is still around us. We have to remember that hatred is destructive, whereas love builds. Hatred looks at the negative, at that which is bad in another individual, whereas love unifies, tries to search for the good that is in every individual. One who is loving is considerate and is caring of somebody else. One who has a hatred or negative opinion, whatever it is, against somebody else that is capable of speaking bad about him, he will always be distant. He He will have a hard time being considerate he will have a hard time giving charity to another Jew, being kind, because he looks down at people. Lashonara, hatred, is divisive. It destroys, whereas love has the power to build and to unify. My suggestion as to what to do immediately to eradicate the Sinat Chinam is, number one, to speak good about every Jew that's out there, to give him the benefit of the doubt, to look positively that, that everyone is created in the image of God, has something good in him, perhaps he's ignorant, perhaps he does not know, perhaps he didn't mean what he did or said. Always try to look for the good in every individual, always try to give him the benefit of the doubt. So what we're doing, what we're accomplishing by having that attitude, that approach of speaking good and positively about everyone, that will counter the Lashonara, which is the exact opposite of speaking negatively, looking down at people. Right? So speak good. Look for the good in everyone. 
and try to defend every Jew. That's number one. Number two, of course, is to increase the tzedakah and the chesed, acts of kindness and acts of charity towards everyone. That is what bonds us. We have to feel that we are one family. How are you going to feel it? By actually giving, giving of your time, giving of your money, giving of whatever you care or you can to somebody else. Even though it's hard, but when we do these things, our hearts are affected by our actions. The more we do these mitzvot, the mitzvot, this practice will influence us, will make us become givers, not just takers. And this is the tikkun for the generation of Mashiach. This is the tikkun of the Sinat Chinam, is to increase Ahavat Chinam, the opposite of baseless hatred. Sinat Chinam is Ahavat Chinam. Do it just because you need to care about him. Kol Yisrael Arevim Zelazeh, we're all responsible for each other. If you have the means, Al Tamod Al Dam Re'achad, the Torah says, don't stand behind when you can help somebody. When you can help him, when you can save his life, don't stand idle and do nothing. You will be held accountable if you were able to say a good word to, dis to defend someone, to get him out of trouble, and you didn't. If you could offer some help, there's no reason you shouldn't. If you try it, if you do your best to, to help, to be considerate, eventually, hopefully, you will feel that he's your brother. You will feel that he's a part of you. You will share in his pain. It will bother you if he's in trouble. You will have kavod for him. You will have respect for him. This is the way we eradicate Sinat Chinam. However, I'd like to add that the greatest chesed of all, the greatest act of kindness, is what? What's the greatest charity you can do for someone? Not to give him money. That's important. Give him a job is extremely important. You know what the greatest act of kindness you can do for someone? Is to bring him back with Shuvah. If he's distant from Judaism and you have a, a positive influence over him, you're saving his soul. You're not necessarily saving his physical life, you're saving his soul. And his children's souls and his grandchildren's souls. One who really cares about another Jew cares about the Olam Abba of that Jew, that that Jew should have the, a share to the world to come. Not just me. I don't want everything just for myself. Some people say, you know what, Shalom Alai Nafshi. Let, you know, I want to be in peace. I don't want to be bothered. I don't want to have to go out and tell others what to do. No, you can't have that attitude. If you really care about him, if you really treat him as your brother, then you're going to look after, look after him. You're going to try to help him in any way you can. And if he's lost or misled, and you may have some impact on him, then try. That will be the greatest favor, the greatest act of charity and kindness that you may ever do in your life. I'd like to finish with what the rabbis remind us. Shalom kli machzik bracha ela shalom. The greatest vessel that can hold all the blessings is shalom. When there's shalom bait, peace at home, HaKadosh Baruch says, I want to give you all my blessings. But if your vessel has holes, they cannot contain the blessings. The house will fall apart. One may lose his parnasai, his livelihood, because there's no shalom bait. There's no vessel to contain all the blessings. Hashem wants to give the Jewish people so much blessing, but He wants us to have a vessel to contain it. That vessel is called shalom. Shalom is the greatest and most powerful weapon that we have against any of our enemies if there is peace amongst us and peace between us and Avinu Sheba Shamaim. That is what we should be praying for. By increasing, by intensifying the chesed, the acts of chesed and zakah with other Jews, what we will cause immediately is that HaKadosh Baruch Hu will also do with us lifnim meshurat adin. In other words, He will not be strict with us. He will be in kind also with us in the same way we are with others, midah keneged midah, he will also show mercy and kindness. And that is, of course, what we pray for, that the redemption, which unfortunately, according to the prophecies, is fraught with many tribulations, many problems and obstacles and difficulties, till we are able to come back to Israel, wars, terrorism, all of these are tribulations. We pray that it should be with kindness and with mercy. That HaKadosh Baruch Hu should bring us out from the diaspora with love, with kindness and consideration 
with pity, we've suffered already enough. But Hashem says, you want me to do that that way? I want to see you do that that way too. Treat your brother fairly. Treat him as an equal. Be considerate of him. Don't look down at him just because he doesn't know anything. Don't look down at him just because he's darker than you. Don't look down at him for any reason whatsoever. He's a Jew just like you. He's a human being. Train yourself to fulfill the mitzvah of because this is a tremendous, important foundation for all the mitzvot in the Torah. And if we do so, Bezat Hashem, we will succeed in being a nation that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is part of us. Mamlechet Kohanim Vigoy Kadosh. Thank you.